The book of Job is the conflict area here because many people believe behemoth and leviathan were dinosaurs. The word behema, behemoth, just simply means the largest of beasts, the brute beast par excellence. Whatever the biggest beast was that got off the ark with Noah is the behemoth. It, it could be a dinosaur, sure, but as you might have guessed uh, from the slide here, uh, I'm going to contend that it is the elephant. The behemoth is the elephant. These 20 Bible commentators of yesteryear all believed that the behemoth was either the elephant or the hippo. And they said predominantly that it was the hippo. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a few minutes. So the first point I have, and I have four to convince you that the elephant is the behemoth, is that in Job 40 and verse 17, where it says that the behemoth moves its tail like a cedar, that is an action verb. The tail like the cedar is the main objection that people have to the behemoth being an elephant. If you listen to Ken Ham and, and other individuals, they'll show you uh, pictures of the elephant and they'll say, that's, that's not a cedar. That's not the size of a cedar at all. And then they'll show a dinosaur, and they'll show the giant tail of a dinosaur, and they'll say, that is a cedar tail. But my point is that uh, this is an action verb. It moves like a cedar, not an adjective. In other words, the Bible is not saying the behemoth's tail is as big as a cedar. Rather, it is saying the movement is like a cedar. And that is a very important point. And God is using hyperbole here when he says, like a cedar. Just a few verses earlier in describing the horse, God uses hyperbole. He says, have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Did God literally clothe, clothe the horse's neck with thunder? Obviously, no. That's expressive imagery. It is conscious exaggeration for the sake of effect. And I believe that's what's going on with the description of the behemoth's tail in this place. Here is uh, the meaning of, again, it's a verb. He straightens his tail like a cedar. And here are some of the translations. Uh, you may have read these before. ESV says he makes his tail stiff like a cedar. NIV Berean, his tail sways like a cedar. NASB bends like a cedar. ISV, his tail pro protrudes stiffly like a cedar. Is there any way that the elephant does this, that it uh, bends its tail or stiffens its tail like a cedar? It just so happens there is. If you're a tourist and you're going to Africa on safari, you're going to be taught the elephant warning signals in case you uh, have a conversation with a bull elephant. The elephant, if they're angry, will stomp the ground, flap their ears, shake their head, trumpet loudly, and number four on this list, they will stiffen their tail. And if you see that, then you get out of there because the elephant is about to stomp you into the ground. And so this is a widely known aspect of the elephant. Here's a painting from Warfare in India. And you can see here this charging elephant has stiffened its tail. This was the last thing that many Roman soldiers saw before Hannibal's Carthaginian elephants turned them into uh, Latin pulp. So, and a side, a side point here I wanted to make is that elephants were used by the ancient Chinese, the Indian Empire, the Persians. Alexander the Great had 85 elephants. Ptolemy the Egyptian had elephants. The Romans even used elephants. And we have meticulous records of the warfare of these ancient uh, nations. But do you know what no ancient army ever used in warfare? A dinosaur. Never once did a brontosaur or a sauropod or a triceratops charge the infantry. It didn't happen, but it did happen with elephants. Here's a man in Thailand praying for his life after elephants attacked him and his moped. And notice the elephant's tails. Uh, the adult elephant has a stiff tail. The teenage uh, elephant has a stiff tail. They're not happy at all. And this man is praying for his life to the elephants. You've heard of the right hand of fellowship. This is the stiff tail of anger. This unfortunate man is finding out that this is a warning sign that you don't want to ignore. So, the point of this being, sure, you could apply this to a sauropod, dinosaur, but it applies also to the elephant. And saying that it doesn't is inserting something in the scripture uh, that isn't necessarily true. This in itself, I agree, doesn't prove it to be the elephant. 
but I think you can accept that elephants are known to stiffen their tails like a cedar. Secondly, God gave behemoth a sword. <clears throat> Verse 19 is translated, uh, he is the first of the ways of God, only he who made him can bring near his sword. An alternative uh, translation of this verse is found here in the word biblical commentary, he that hath made him hath furnished him with a sword. In other words, God gave behemoth his sword. And the ASV, which is very literal, uses this, he only that made him giveth him his sword. God gave him a sword. Darby, he that made him gave him a sword. And I want you to notice <clears throat> the elephant's tusks. God gave the behemoth a sword, a modified incisor tooth, which is huge and sword-like. That is a sword. And remember, this is a grass eater. What's a grass eater doing with a sword? God gave it to him. Sauropod dinosaurs don't have swords. They have flat, small teeth, relatively small, that are not like swords at all. Okay, two more arguments why the elephant is the behemoth. And this really focuses in on why I believe the elephant is the answer to this riddle. The sauropod dinosaur is the wrong size. Notice verses 21 and 22. Speaking of behemoth, he lies under the lotus trees in a covert of reeds and marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. The lotus tree that is mentioned there by God is defined by the theological workbook of the Old Testament as the Zisiphus lotus of the buckthorn family, a deciduous shrub of the Mediterranean region, height 6.6 to 16.4 feet. This is the tree that covers the behemoth with shade. The elephant is known, this tree is taller than that, this isn't a lotus tree, but the elephant is known to take shade under trees. What would happen if a sauropod dinosaur tried to get under that tree? That tree would be uprooted and destroyed. Here's a diagrammatic representation of a titanosaur next to the Statue of Liberty and a 25-foot tree. Uh, this description doesn't work for the sauropod. The behemoth has to be the largest land animal ever. And by the way, sauropods are now up to 30 meters, according to paleontologists, in height and the sauropod doesn't fit beneath the Jordan River's lotus tree. You turn this animal to its side, it's 130 feet long. The scrubby foliage of the Jordan River isn't going to cut it. Now, let's continue on. It says that he is in a covert. You, you know what covert means. What is a covert agent? A covert agent is a secret agent, and he's in that uh, marsh and reeds where he is covered. He's secret in that place. Again, perfect for the elephant, but I would contend impossible for the, uh, for the dinosaur. And then fourthly, the elephant snorkels in the flooded Jordan. Verse 23 says, indeed the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth. The raging Jordan doesn't bother the behemoth. He's confident even though there's water in his mouth. There's turbulence, there's flooding, and he doesn't give a care in the world. Now, let me ask you, what, what air-breathing mammal is that true of? If you get water in your mouth, are you afraid of drowning? Any air-breathing mammal is. And we're going to answer how the elephant fits this picture in a minute. But first, consider how deep did the Jordan get? We know from Joshua 3.15 that the Jordan overflowed its banks when Mount Hermon uh, flooded the area in spring, when the Israelites crossed the Jordan. It was a mile wide, but only 12 feet deep. So when God uh, divided the Jordan, He divided a mile wide Jordan that was only 12 feet deep. Here is a sauropod. And uh, this is 12 feet here. You can see the people down here. So this might be actually a little over 12 feet. This is as deep as the Jordan River gets in the flood. And you can see it's not even up to the shoulders of this creature. Here's double the depth of the flood of Jordan, and it's at the shoulders. Here is the animal's head way up here. I ask you, when is the flooded Jordan ever going to be a problem for the sauropod? When is the water going to get in the sauropod's mouth? Never, because the Jordan is too shallow for this creature uh, to even really swim in. So let's go back to the elephant. I, I said earlier most of the commentators say the hippo is 
uh, the behemoth. And why did they say that? Because the word demands the largest land mammal that got off the ark, the first of God's work. They said it because they didn't understand that the elephant is aquatic. They thought the hippo was a better answer, even though it's smaller, because the hippo is aquatic. They thought the elephant was a creature of the plains of the savanna, and uh, they didn't think the elephant was at home in the water. But you know what we found out in just the last few years? We found out that the elephant has a marvelous anatomic uh, change. And this is Physiology 2002. The elephant is the only mammal whose pleural space, that's the space around your lungs, is obliterated by connective tissue. This has been known for 300 years but never explained. The elephant is the only animal that can snorkel at depth. Just recently explained. The elephant is a Navy SEAL expert snorkeler. And the old Titan commentators, they didn't, they didn't know that. They didn't know that about the elephant. Near where Shahe uh, is working in, it's not actually near, it's like 600 miles. But <laughs> if he decided to go on vacation from Malaysia, he could go to the Andaman Islands and snorkel with the elephants. That's something you can do to get away. Elephants, I didn't know this, but they're amazing swimmers. This elephant was found 16 kilometers out at sea uh, by the Coast Guard and guided back to shore. They have professional snorkeling gear that God has designed, and they do the snorkeling with water in their eyes and water in their mouth, just like the scripture says. And they swim all the way back to shore. So back to these verses. The river's raging. The behemoth is not disturbed, even though the Jordan's in his mouth, even though the Jordan's in his eyes. Okay, what about 24b here, or one pierces his nose with a snare. These words have been added by the New King James translators. They didn't understand what uh, the Hebrew was saying, and so they added these words to make it sound like somebody's trying to capture the behemoth. And, but here's the KJV. KJV says, he taketh it in his eyes, the water, his nose pierces through snares. In Matthew and Exodus and Psalms and, and Matthew again, the flood is described uh, as a trap, as a snare. It comes upon the whole world. So the elephant takes water in his eyes and his mouth, yet his trunk pierces through the snare of the flood. What a better, uh, what better way to describe the elephant, I'm not sure. And you might say that's a little bit, that interpretation is a little out there. Word biblical commentary again, David Klein's, uh, it's an acceptable translation. Into his mouth with open eyes, he receives it, the river water. Alone among the river animals, his snout is dry. The anatomy of the sauropod doesn't work for this. But the anatomy of the elephant is perfect. In summary, for this portion, the elephant fits every particular of the description God gives us. He stiffens his tail like a cedar right before he stomps you. He has a God-sized sword given to him. He can secretly hide under the lotus tree. And even though the Jordan's in his eyes and his mouth, his trunk is dry and he swims to safety. That's a very precise description of the behemoth. And I think the commentators would have said it was the elephant if they had known about the aquatic nature of the elephant. I believe the largest animal to get off the ark with Noah was the elephant. And that means dinosaurs weren't there. We have to stay true to the biblical context and not allow our confirmation bias to have us talk about dinosaurs when they don't fit the picture.